whenever you're ready. Okay. All right. Sorry for the repeat. For those of you that are already on, I'm Mike Zablowski. I'm the K-12 Science Coordinator for uh, Columbia Public Schools in Columbia, Missouri. And this is the session on uh, K, the breakout section 2.1 uh, with K-12 teachers, educators, principals, and superintendents. In a little very brief, because we, we really consciously did not want to talk. We wanted to talk with you instead of at you. But I was lucky enough to be the science coordinator uh, when the 100% total eclipse came through Columbia, Missouri in 2017. And I really, uh, it brought back a lot of memories uh, because when I was listening to Dennis talk about in that first 15 minutes, the, the good and the bad, um, a lot of that was happening around here. And I was lucky enough to be in a school that uh, I mean, they debated, uh, should we shut down? And they were almost thinking about shutting down. But then we decided, no, we have all our, particularly our free and reduced lunch kids, they were just missing. And so we held school. It was mandatory that every classroom, we, are, we have 32 schools, so about 19, 20,000 kids. Uh, it was mandatory that <clears throat> every school completely uh, shut down for an hour, you know, around that total eclipse part and go outside. Uh, we bought glasses for all students. Uh, we just, it, and we made it, a, it, we had learning, we had learning resources right before, even though it was only our third day of school. And it was absolutely fantastic. There was all these worries that the traffic was going to be, it was going to take buses hours to get kids home like it was a snow day. None of it. Uh, it was like a football weekend here. Uh, with not a big deal. We had neighboring schools around that did close or didn't have little issues, but it was not it, it just didn't happen. Uh, it, it was a wonderful day that people still talk about. So I just wanted to intro that uh, before we introduce the other people and then really got to your discussion. So uh, if we could, could I have, and you, you already heard from Dennis a little bit, but Dennis, just in case they missed, can we start with you and just introduce yourself really quick? Um, I'm Dennis Schatz. I'm the immediate past president of the National Science Teaching Association and uh, I'm currently a senior fellow of the Institute for Learning Innovation and was uh, you know, a key player at the Pacific Science Center in 2017 and uh, with a big library project, which we'll talk about tomorrow around the uh, 2017 eclipse. Great, thank you. Uh, Angela, could you introduce yourself? Uh, absolutely, Angela Turner. I am a teacher at a STEAM Academy with Southwest Independent School District in San Antonio, Texas. I've been a science and technology educator for the past 23 years. Great. Thank you. And last but not least, Theo. <laughs> Hi, I'm a solar system ambassador, um, amateur astronomer. And for 2017, I ended up being what they called the eclipse coordinator uh, for uh, Western Kentucky University, which was basically a huge outreach program. We weren't near as, as good as Bob Bear, but that's kind of what we were going for. Uh, we had a stadium event, but we were looking to get kids because we had so many that were at the 99.9% .9 line and we wanted to get them into totality. But yeah, our goal was to have kids in school if possible, to provide the teachers with stuff. We distributed over 100,000 pairs of glasses. So we had a good time and, you know, I, I Debated whether to get involved in this one, but you know, it's when you've done it once, you kind of want to do it again. So here we go. Yeah, here we go. It's right. You know what? I didn't say I, I should have did this. I we we worked so hard on the last eclipse that I guess I ran my body down and got to school that that day, and I had 104 fever, um, and and I I got some kind of virus, and I didn't even care. I just drugged myself up and had a great time and would do it again. So it, it's that worth it. Uh, you don't wanna miss anything like this. What we would like to do uh, uh, is for you to add any questions, comments, anything you would like to chat, and then we will have those discussions. Um, I know we have several people monitoring the chat. Uh, and so I'm just gonna give a minute for that to happen. And while you guys put your questions in there, please ask us anything. But while you do that, I do have a couple questions just to get us started for the panel. And so in any, uh, in any order, whoever would like to say this, the first one is for your particular area. What do you think worked really well uh, in 2017? And if you had the chance, which we do, what would you do better in 23 or 24? Hmm. 
Well, pursuant to what Dennis had said, we did actually have a chance to talk to administrators. Um, Kentucky has a weird organization, and so they actually had a meeting uh, like the November before of all the regional superintendents. So we had five minutes to give our pitch to all of them, but we passed out cards, who wants to know more? And then we scheduled visits with as many as we could possibly go see. So we did actually start at that level. Um, that was good. And it, it got us in the door a lot of places, but we really needed to also talk to the school boards because that's where a lot of the static actually ended up coming from. So if we had to do it over again, we would have maybe, and of course that's hard, right? That's not during normal business hours. That's usually night and so forth and so on, but yeah. well, that would have been a good thing. Sure. Uh, Angela or Dennis, any, anything to add? Uh, it's hard to add. It's hard to add more than what I already said and what yes, I found exactly. out in my survey of teachers. Um, I think it's a it's a good point about what Theo brought up of getting to board members. You know, it's the because uh, and the board members have a national association also. So I wonder if there's a way in which we can try and get to them, not having to go to every board meeting in the country. Fifteen thousand meetings might be a little <laughs> bit much, um, but. How do we how do we get to them and in other ways? Yep. And then speaking from a K-12 perspective, um, we really turn in the classroom, one of the resources we turn to often is Twitter. And so I will uh, say that in 2017, we actually had a staff development day that day. I was actually in the role of a, a technology director in 2017. So um, during our staff development day, we just all went outside and kind of did our, our own thing as educators, but we didn't have our students on campus. So in regards to the communication pieces that we received, I mean, they were far and few between from what we can remember. So really touching base at the district level with whoever oversees science, usually you have your science academic coaches, you have your curriculum coordinators, um, those are going to be people you really want to reach out to. You'll find most of those people on the Twitter platform for education and Facebook, of course, because those are the two social media platforms we turn to the most. Yep, I'd agree. And I'll just add a little bit. And then we have our first question in the chat. Um, what Angela said is really uh, spot on with what we did. We did not. We, we kind of started just advertising like almost where we are now. We started putting little blurbs out there. Oh, a, a, well over a year just to get people excited about it. And our view there is, now we are a big district, we're a university town, so frankly, we had it easier. It was the smaller school districts around us that did not have science coordinators or curriculum people. That's where I think I saw it bogged down a little bit more. And so what we were just trying to do is make sure um, that we got people excited that it was an expectation that these kids were going to get that. That's what worked for us. Um, and I'll just stop there because we have a lot of, some. we have several questions now uh, that kind of address, I don't wanna jump ahead of myself. So the first one, which is from uh, CJ Woodford, uh, what would be the recommended way to engage schools, students and teachers? Should it be a hybrid approach of reaching out to teachers and administrators? up to say regional level, or is it better, more efficient to go top down and start at school boards and get them on board first? Um, I don't wanna do all the talking. So uh, I'd say probably Angela or Theo or uh, anybody have an idea there. I'll say from the school board, cause I also had the uh, opportunity to serve on my local school board here. And, and like I said, I live in rural America, but I work and teach in San Antonio cause we're about 35 miles South of San Antonio. Um, from the school boards, a lot of people really don't tune in to the streamed meetings or read the minutes. Usually as an educator, we receive like a reflective email that kind of gives a synopsis of everything that was spoken to in regards to topics at the school board meeting. Really, I mean, the, with the, the way things are with our tight schedules, we really just do social media. So as long as we have a presence there for the events, um, we're fortunate in that we have the SCOBY Education Center at our San Antonio College, and so they've already started to promote and give us some information. So we do have that um, information coming to us from that level. But when it comes to engaging students, I'll, I'll use this as an example. Um, 
We like to identify different days throughout the school year. And so a big one that is well known, I think internationally is the International Dot Day. And they have a one page website. And what they start doing is as we get closer, it'll be a monthly email with a cool activity that's tied in that we can do with our students. These activities are like a five to 10 minute um, bell ringer, you know, just something plain and simple. That kind of gets us, you know, getting into the spirit of working towards that um, day and the events that we do on that day. So really there's a lot of information. As an educator, when I go and look at the, the information that's out there, there are a ton of different websites if we all kind of had one website to reference that had maybe links to all the others, and then of course a hashtag to follow, that kind of helps put everything in perspective for us. So we're not hunting for a lot of things. We just go to one, a one-stop shop. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just saying, I think someone was talking about the hybrid approach. I think this is, it's not a top down or a bottom up. It's really who, who within my context, my area, I can reach and, and feel effective. You know, that might be in one place, the PTA is going to be a good place to get the parents. In other places, it may not be, um, you know, I have, I've worked with a school board, so I can get to the school board. I think we need to try and get to all of them in the best way we can. Yep. Yep. We've got getting to teacher workshops too, if you can. I mean, that's another thing. And I'm cheerful to do at, you know, those where they have days set aside. And I know we did a lot to show, again, to showcase those simple activities, to go out and do them with the teachers so that they felt comfortable, especially when you're talking about solar observing. So you want everybody to feel really comfortable about that. And I mean, after a whole year of looking at the sun, if when somebody said, isn't that dangerous, you know, it was really hard to say, what are you kidding me? I've been doing this all year, but you know, people aren't comfortable and you have to make them comfortable with that. Yeah. And what I also say is this is this time around, this is so much easier, I think on, on uh, people because they just have to look at what happened in 2017. I would be happy to share all the news and everything we got. I'm sure everybody on here would do the same. Nobody got hurt. Nobody complained. There was no outrage. I mean, it was it was only a positive day. It just worked perfect. I, I will also say to finish this question off, we actually had our calendar committee for our district actually put a, you know how they do the yearly calendars and they have to do it about a year in advance. Uh, and they have all these symbols on it. One of our symbols was a sun. And so they put it on there. So everybody knew um, it, it just was a great day, but I just think it's going to be easier for all, all of you that didn't do it last time. Now you have all of us to, to learn from and, and realize nobody went blind. Nobody, every, everything was great. Uh, this is more of a comment from Lindsay. Uh, also, don't discount parent ability to influence, influence school leadership so we could work to inform them to help reach the school leadership. Absolutely. Uh, we would have had more outrage in our district if we did not allow kids to see this. Um, we, we toyed and I get that some schools closed so they could see it with their families. And I'll admit our attendance was lower, way lower, but that was only because not because of scared, they wanted to enjoy it as a family. So, so there's that, which I completely get, but if we would have closed school, we know that there were students that would have missed it because they didn't know it was a big deal. I was at a high school, uh, when this occurred and some of the students leading up to it, you know, they're in high school, they're cool. And they were like, what is the big deal? Why are we standing out here? It's 98 degrees. And they were clearly like, this is going to be so lame. And then it happened. And we actually had them on film, the same ones that said, this is going to be so lame. They were jumping up and down screaming. Uh, so if they, if, it, if they were home, they may have napped through it. And so we thought we gave them that. But I agree. Parents can make the world a difference there. Andrew Wayne, says, Wayne, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Wayne has his hand up. He's had it up for oh, a while. Oh, I so cannot I, see. Yes. If somebody can follow that, I cannot see that. Yeah, no, um, that's fine. That's why I thought maybe you yes. had seen it. OK, Wayne. Yeah, he's still muted, Wayne. OK. Uh, in 2017, uh, Pensacola was, of course, well off the center line and will be in about the same shape in 2023 and 2024. But we did run events with our local PBS station, uh, which in got included on NOVA that evening in the national report uh, at the uh, 
Space and Science Theater. We plan to do the same thing with these eclipses. Uh, we're getting started very early. Uh, Saturday week, uh, a, a local church is doing a uh, jelly bean run to run uh, to uh, raise funds for a water filtration uh, village in uh, Peru. And the Astronomy Club is co-sponsoring the run. Uh, we are serving, of course, as hydration, sunny delight. And uh, <laughs> we are uh, handing out uh, uh, the uh, uh, star charts. We're giving them the list of our beach gazes, which start tonight at Pensacola Beach Pavilion. Uh, but we're also going to be giving them a flyer on the... Uh, uh, on the eclipses, uh, we will probably use the Astronomical League's uh, glasses as we did in 2017, and then write in the uh, times of uh, the events for the Pensacola area on those that we distribute to our school kids. Uh, something that worked really well in 2017 was... Uh, not pinhole projection, but flat mirror projection. If you have a good front service flat mirror, one or two inches is plenty. Cats, of course, is plenty big enough. Uh, but give it about a 50 foot throw distance, put up a large uh, sheet or something uh, in the shade of a building. And uh, then, of course, mount your mirror on a tiltable tripod or something that can be adjusted every few minutes for dyno motion. And uh, you will see large sunspots on the projected disk of the sun with a disk maybe uh, five to 10 inches across with a 50 foot throw distance. And then, of course, you will see the stages of the partial eclipse. And this is something that. Uh, uh, everybody with smartphones and stuff can just walk over to the wall and, and uh, have uh, have selfies with the eclipse in the background on the sheet, and they and their buddies in the foreground talking about the partial phases. Now, of course, if you're lucky enough to be close enough to totality, uh, then you're going to have much more impressive selfies than that whenever it happens. But uh, again. Uh, I think the idea that partial eclipses are not that good uh, is uh, uh, something that we have to deal with because it's something that 99% of us are going to be witnessing for these two events. Uh, but uh, of course, haven't mentioned it yet, but there's always get in the shade of the tree. And particularly about 30, 40 minutes before totality, you're going to start seeing an impressive number of crescents dancing on the ground. And again, a great opportunity for selfies with your smartphones, uh, for family shots. As to the issue of school in or school out, I would say for most of us, school in, uh, if we have to use video feeds from NASA or Astronomical League or something in the classroom to show the totality, uh, that's fine. At least they'll hear uh, the background sounds and see people really getting all excited in the path of totality. But if they can go outside, or if nothing else, the flat mirror I suggested, project the image into the classroom. If your classroom has a window and has a blackboard, then have a student mark out the crescent at 11.15 and another student take a piece of chalk and mark out the crescent at 11.30. Don't move the tripod. And ask the students, why is the image of the sun on the blackboard shifting across the blackboard? And maybe some of them will figure out that's because the earth is rotating. The sun isn't in the same place as it was 15 minutes ago. And so there again, with your smartphone, you have a graphic record for the class of a class project where they recorded the partial phase of the eclipse on the blackboard in the classroom. Yeah. We have another uh, Brian, Brad, oops. I thought he had his hand up. He took his hand down, sorry. Okay. 
Yep, and I don't see any other hands. We do, uh, you can all follow the chat though. We have a lot of suggestions. Some people are giving links to different videos of the different kids screaming. And I mean, it was, you know, I think my favorite moment, obviously I could only be in one school. And so we had 30 schools all around and we didn't give any instructions on what to do when you looked at it. We just gave instructions on how to look at it. Every single school, all 30 said without any prompting that they, uh, all started screaming, like cheering and clapping when it occurred. And I've heard that from all around. And that, to me, it, it almost gives me chills now. It's like, that. how cool was that? I mean, that obviously they loved it. It was a great day. So Matt has his hand up. He was the one okay. that yep. before. Yeah, hi. Um, so getting back to reaching teachers, administrators, and um, school boards, um, People have talked about creating perhaps a form letter or something that we could all use. And it occurs to me that that letter should, would have to be a little different depending on whether you're in a region where you have totality or not, uh, because there are additional issues to address uh, if you have totality. So whoever is creating these letters, I just encourage them to, to tailor them to those two situations. Thanks. That is a really good point. And I will say too about the letters, and this is not bashing administration at all. I mean, I'm kind of one of them. They get so many letters that I think if, if one organization sends out letters, I think it'll get lost. I think that's what should be done. But I also think that making sure teachers, science teachers have access to those letters or parents so that they can also give their, I mean, I think their administrator will look at something from somebody they know uh, but I, I know they get so much mail every day. So. All right, any other hands up? I'm checking here. Or, uh, yeah, oh, I just saw a thought disappear. Wayne and Andy have their hands up. There was okay. also in the, in the chat, there was a question about, I think this was from Dan, about connecting to other subjects besides science. What are people doing in music? There were some answers, there were some comments in the chat, but maybe people want to add some yeah. things too if they raise their hand. So it's Wayne, Andy, then Dan. Okay. Hands. Okay. Uh, this is just a shout out to Andy Fragnoy. Andy, uh, we are already using your astronomy NetStacks uh, open source uh, book with the University of Tennessee's uh, uh, astronomy classes. Uh, we have 21 different campuses using it. And right now, all we're doing is solar system astronomy. So I've been pressing them to let's go ahead and expand it because my students talk about wanting to learn about stars and galaxies. So you'll be delighted. We will be getting to the latter part of your book uh, starting in the summer when we introduce our new stars and galaxies, ASTR 1020 uh, to the 21 campuses in the University of Tennessee network. So thank you so much for providing this wonderful resource for distance learners with the OpenStax uh, astronomy textbook. It is certainly appreciated and I've just developed the labs for it and we're looking forward to field testing them in four months. That's thank, wonderful. Thank you for, for those kind words. For people who don't know what Wayne is talking about, I have the privilege to be the lead author of this nonprofit project to produce a free online introductory astronomy textbook uh, published by the nonprofit OpenStax Project. And Wayne, you'll be uh, appreciating that we just heard that we went over 700,000 users this year. And uh, the, the, the project calculated that we've now saved astronomy students $56 million in textbooks costs. So, that's very yeah. gratifying. But I had a question for the group, for the panelists and the group, which is, uh, so we're, I think we did a good job in 2017 in getting to the science teachers, but I think we didn't do a really good job in getting to those teachers who are not middle school or high school science teachers and who may not be members of the National Science Teaching Association. And I wondered if the panelists or any of the people here had any luck in reaching the non-science teachers. And if you have any advice or thoughts for us about how in an organized way we might reach 
for example, elementary school teachers who don't have a science person in their school? I can briefly just say that was kind of my job. I am the science coordinator for our district, but it was I was tasked with reaching all, that it does include though all elementary teachers because they teach everything. So what we did, and I'd be happy to dig this out, It's I have it, we put a packet together that was interdisciplinary, that uh, had some math, definitely a lot of art. Um, so we tried to make sure that everybody was covered uh, with at least some activity for this. And I'll let others on the panel or group. And then, uh, and then I also have a hand up from, I, we haven't forgot, uh, Rick and Dan, you're gonna be next. But uh, to answer that question, anybody have any other ideas? Yeah, that's, I think that's important because you're asking, uh, you know, sometimes you go, you're going to donate this whole day and the teachers are going, but that's just for science. And so it really does need to be interdisciplinary. And yeah, we had, I, and I should dig out some of my links on this too. We wanted to have people look, there's, you know, reading that you can do on this. There's history of all kinds you can do on this, you, you know, and make it that way so that nobody felt like we were dissing all the rest of the subjects. And, and of course, there was a huge amount of creativity as far as solar viewing and especially for the little kids. Um, if you haven't seen pictures of kindergartners with their viewers embedded in pie plates, I mean, they did all sorts yes. of amazing decorations. Yes. So, and, and, you know, one thing to put that to fear about that you're, you're losing a whole day just for science, Maybe. good luck teaching anything else that day because your <laughs> attendance is going to be so low. It really is. I mean, we were at probably 65, 70%. And that's okay, because it was for their good reasons. They just wanted to experience it with families. But what teacher would teach a new lesson in math or language arts on that day anyway? So embrace it and have fun. One, I did, see, go ahead. I mean, one of our goals with the last time was with high school and middle school teachers was how to get the teachers to use their classes resources to inform the rest of the school and therefore it becomes a teaching moment for the students in that class, but then a way in which to uh, involve the rest of the school and get them ready to view the eclipse. Yep. yep. But let me, let me just turn this question around a tiny bit. So we know to reach science teachers, they have an organization. Where we had trouble was reaching things like the National Education Association, the more general teacher organization. So if anyone has contacts there, if anyone has suggestions about how to, how to get this in front of the more generic teacher organizations, I think the task force would appreciate any help with that. Yep, agreed. All right, you guys, a few of you have been, I have, uh, and Julie, you're on the list too now, but Dan, I think you are up next, followed by Rick, then Julie. Uh, so I wanted to cover a couple of things. Uh, one, yeah, going the history route, totally on board. I know here in uh, upstate New York, we have the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is taught as part of fourth grade history, was actually started under a total solar eclipse, at least according to local legend. So that talks, uh, connects into history. We've or he's talking to uh, art teachers. Uh, one thing I would like to remind people is reach out to a lot of the clubs uh, as someone who went through FIRST Robotics. If the timing is correct in my head of when championships normally is, you have the largest STEM event for high schoolers taking place during a total solar eclipse. And I'm talking like 40,000 students from all across the globe. And if you were to, you know, start talking to the regionals a year or so in advance and start activating people, which normally take place in March. So you could, you know, remind people about a month ahead of time. You already have this network of about uh, a couple hundred thousand students across the US, Canada, Mexico. Uh, and a lot of those uh, as elementary school with First Lego League, usually in the fall, if you're to tap into that network, that is a lot of people who are already passionate, who love to volunteer. I'm sure there's a number of first teams who would love to be at whatever events you are planning and you know, getting people energized. Uh, but one of the other things I also want to pitch is, has anyone thought about activating students to help promote the eclipse to other students, not necessarily within the school, but out of school? Uh, one thing I've personally have noticed is that teens are much better at talking to other teens than any of us. Uh, at least, you know, they get less eye rolls. Uh, so then we might be able to tap into some of the energy mm -hmm. from them because you give them the opportunity to share their voice, they'll go and 
run with it. Uh, you know, I think of those times with um, the White House Science Fair a couple of years ago. Those teams are fantastic. Yep. Uh, love- Meg, I might have the contacts for the National Org since I've been I mean- part of our planning committee. I think that's a really good point. I do not have experience with, I, we did not do that, but anybody else in the panel or group do anything like that? Looks like your suggestion's a good one, but we just have not thought of it. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you so um, much. May, maybe I can chime in a little bit. So one thing that we did at NSO and also the AAS Solar Physics Division, um, we ran an event in Salem, Oregon in 2017, where we trained a local high school group to uh, be kind of the, the face of public outreach at an Eclipse Day event. And so the, the local students were the ones who were doing the demonstrations and then we they were backed up by the solar scientists um, kind of working side by side with them. And I think that worked really well. We have an extension that we're hoping to run through 2024, but working in, it not only gave the people who are in attendance a more familiar and maybe um, collegial face to talk to, but also it gave the students who were part of that program um, you know, some really specific professional development opportunities and opportunities to get to know uh, solar physicists personally while still in high school. So that was pretty, um, I think that was pretty exciting. That's great. Okay, uh, Rick, I think you're up next. Uh, Then I have Julie David Wayne with hands up. Good afternoon all. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to share, we're doing like a two-prong approach here in New Hampshire. We got um, our governor, Governor Sununu, to sign uh, first in the nation solar eclipse day bill. So we didn't make it a holiday or give kids off from school from that, but it still took us three years with COVID, but he signed a bill into law stating that Monday, April 8th is solar eclipse day here in New Hampshire. So now from that bill, we've got like 30 or 40 people on our New Hampshire uh, Solar Eclipse 2024 working group. So that's how we're doing it from the top. And then at the same time, we're getting the kids involved and just regular citizens of the state with the New Hampshire Solar Eclipse Ambassador Program. And those kids that want to, like fourth graders are great, we're just giving them the job of selling No Child Left Inside on Saturday, <laughs> October 14th, 2023, and Monday, April 8th, 2024. And that's all they got to know and tell their parents and all their teachers and everyone that. And when they say, well, you can go outside on those days. Okay, well, I got to be safe. I need glasses. You don't want to wait. Can you get me glasses today, now? So that helps do that. The 10th graders are great because we're giving them reclaim Corona when they entered school last year, either 10th graders in high school or sophomores, Corona was really had a bad association with the coronavirus, COVID-19. But in two years, when these 10th graders graduate, they get to reclaim Corona and get to claim it for a total solar eclipse and an, not an annular eclipse, because that doesn't have a corona, but you get the idea they can get involved in that. They can go as far with it as they want. Their prom theme for that year could be enchantment under the eclipses instead of enchantment under the sea, but they have a real opportunity from entering school wasn't so good, but now when they graduate, they have two eclipses to celebrate with. So we're enrolling the kids, the, the businesses, hospitality, arrive early, leave late, um, everyone else, we're just saying the eclipses are coming, just getting people to realize that they're coming. And another thing that we're doing, they, they don't need to do this in Texas, but maybe some of the other states, we're using the annular, which is only 20, 25% here in New Hampshire, as a dress rehearsal or a warm up. We're getting emergency medicine, um, doctors, the whole state involved in saying, hey, we've got this coming in six months. Here's a good dry run and a dress rehearsal for our main event. Oh, and by the way, you need glasses for that the whole time. So we're linking the whole things together, coming from the top with the governor and our 
Eclipse Day bill in the bottom with our Solar Eclipse Ambassador Program. And it's uh, so far it's working. So uh, that's just to share with that. I have the, a poster session tonight on the Solar Eclipse Ambassador Program if anyone's interested. And thank Rick, you everyone, some great yeah. ideas. Rick, I have to say that <laughs> everything you said was really exciting. I mean, those are what, what exciting ideas. And I do wanna echo one thing that you said and I saw it just pop up on my screen on the chat, buying the glasses now. Um, I had to buy 20,000 of them for our district. Um, and we bought them probably 15 months early, which I had to convince the district and it, it didn't take much convincing. I said, we're, we're not gonna get these. And that's exactly what happened is districts that waited, they couldn't get them in time. And then they were, or they were being gouged or they had to get like the families had to get their own. We, I needed 20,000, we bought 30,000 and then we sold them for a dollar a piece. I think at that number, yes. I want to say that I got them uh, for, oh my gosh, I want to say I paid 30 cents a piece for them or something, I don't know, something because it was so many. And then we made a lot of that money back um, yep. from, from that. And we actually sold some of them to other school districts, but think about it now. And, buying and the, the great thing is since no one owns the sun, moon or earth, the kids can monetize it. The high school students can can do shirts, hats, whatever they want to do, calendars. Um, it's a huge opportunity because you just tell people, look, this is going to be bigger than the Olympics yeah. or World Cup or a Super yeah. Bowl. And nobody has a patent on it. You know, right. the, re the reason nobody's doing it is because it only comes usually every once every 50 years. We got six months. I mean, Imagine what it's going to be like between these two events and you got to coach people to say, hey, you know, everyone. And that's another thing. Anyone who's getting pushback, do we really need all these glasses? And da, 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 say, look, we've got another one in six months. So we got to buy for two events, not just one. Yep. And the glasses are good education. We kept a lot. Oh. I mean, we, we didn't need 20,000, but those glasses we sent to the elementary schools for looking at the sun on, you know, normal days. It was great. Um, I was going to say, I, I guess I should go. I'm sorry, the screen keeps shifting, but I think Julie, oh, Julie, there was a Julie. Julie, David, Wayne. There we go, Julie, there you are. Yes, Julie, I think you were next. Hey, thanks. Actually, when I raised my hand, we're on another subject. And now I want to oh, ask okay. a question about glasses as well. But I just want to mention something. So I'm from Canada, actually. And during the for the 2021 June annual eclipse, we tried to reach teachers in the northern part of Canada where annularity was going to happen. And it was really hard to reach teachers. So that was on the discussion earlier about how to reach teachers. And as my colleague CJ, who's here actually on the session as well, could attest, like it was really hard to reach teachers. And what actually worked in the end was working with community partners. So some organizations that already have networks within those schools and um, we already have connections with all these teachers, they had a better influence than we had because they didn't know who we were trying to reach them and say, hey, did you know there's an eclipse coming? We have kids to, to, to offer if you want. And that works super well. Like we got to reach many teachers that way. So sometimes thinking about community partners or people who already have a network in the schools, then maybe even if they're not in science, maybe they would be excited about this and they could help you reach teachers. So I just wanted to mention that point. Great. And, and now talking about glasses, I have a question. I have, have, have some of you worked with schools to get sort of a, get you know, school funding instead of selling bread or whatever in schools. I'm sure that that happens in the States as well. Like selling Eclipse glasses, like the kids themselves selling the glasses for fundraising for the school. Has that worked? Has anyone tried we, that? We made $15,000 um, selling both glasses and uh, Eclipse t-shirts. Uh, now, I will say the one thing, but I still thought they were cool. We made black t-shirts because of this, you know, the sky and then uh, boy, black t and, and we sold hundreds black t-shirts on a sunny 98 degree day. I'm, I'm not, maybe I should have rethought that, but, but everybody, uh, I mean, we made 15,000 and uh, we didn't even try. We didn't try. People were reaching out to us. Uh, how about uh, the other panelists? Anybody do anything like that? Certainly in my survey of teachers through NSTA, a number of people were selling glasses. You saw in my presentation, I have a little card that people, uh, that one teacher sent out when they sold them for a dollar. Uh, and uh, I didn't hear, they, they sold 500 of them. I didn't hear the profit, but mm -hmm. I'm sure they did well. Yep. 
I guess, sorry, just uh, like I see some people have done that, but you were already like you knew about the eclipse and the event. I'm just wondering, can we help teachers organize that in their schools? Oh. Like if you're already in a platform, you're already a leader in this field. So, you know, it's there complicated to work with teachers. So they do it themselves. The That's formats. a really good point. And, and I would I, I don't know. I'm sure somebody could do this better than me, but uh, I could write down. I was shocked at how easy it was. You just had to find the right company. You know, you don't buy them on Amazon. You go right to the company. They allowed us to put our own logo on it. Uh, and I'm not doing anything that hundreds of others didn't. But I was shocked. I think that would be a great idea, putting a one pager together of how to use it as a fundraiser, because it was honestly one of the most brainless fundraisers I've ever done. Good idea. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the order, but I have a couple here. But Don, I think you might be next. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. You're good. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. The. Um, okay. A um, couple of things. I think we should consider, we should contact scouting organizations. There are millions of them. They're, they both, between their science, their local schools, they can possibly be worked with the schools and the students if we haven't thought about doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, there are millions and millions of scouts all throughout the country. They have their, their merit badges and, and patches and loops are so good with revisions. If I had my college students learn everything that they had to do for their badges, I'd be very happy in my intro 101 if anybody has actually worked with them. I know some of you have worked with, have worked with them. They're really, really good what they're doing. Um, we might consider um, maybe even convince them to have some sort of solar eclipse badge or looper patch mm -hmm. to, to, to do that. The other issue is that as part of the Astronomy Festival on National Mall that I run, I've worked with the Smithsonian Museums. And they created a program called Solstice Saturday. This was in 2019, where we had 10,000 people there. Last time we did a real public event. Uh, they, they got many, they got 75,000 more people there from 6 p.m. till midnight. But the museums only two are science museums. So maybe we can convince other museums to get involved with something. Again, natural history and air and space, the only science museums. They had art, music, costume, clocks with the sun motif astronomy wallpaper, gelato. They had many, many different activities that they had with their different museums from a cultural point of view and with the solstice, but the solstice was of course all about the sun and maybe they could, they might be interested and I'll talk to my contacts there, they might be interested in doing something. They have, not only their museums, they have 250 affiliate museums throughout the country. So this would be in addition to, you know, of course, the Science Museum people, which I'm sure already, I'm sure there are people here with better context, you know, with, with the, with the at Science Museums, but, and planetariums, I'm sure are all, all aware of this. We should consider the other museums. Yep. And I'm sure, I know there are museum organizations as well. Great. But if we can get something like the Smithsonian on board, on board that might be good. Don, I got to ask you, do you have a date for that National Mall uh, astronomy show you were telling me about earlier? Yes, uh, June 25th. June 25th. June 25th. Um, and we're inviting anybody who wants to come to come to that. We're, we have not only people like NSF, uh, we've got National Optical Astronomy Observatory, now Noir Lab, NRAO is coming. We have NSF, Naval Observatory. And this year, the planetary science will be planetary society will be coming, and I'm hoping to get Bill Nye to open up the event because they're having a, a related reception at, at one of the museums. So we're trying to make this the largest astronomy, and other than eclipses, we believe this is the largest annual astronomy outreach event in the country. Any possibility of the White House having a star party like they did under President Obama? Well, this is why I started it because the White House Star Party, only, only a few people, I wasn't one of the people who invited there. So I created a public event the year next, next year, Astronomy Festival on the National Mall. I started in 2010. And we were actually co-sponsored by OSTP at the time. And so we're, we, were up, we were up on the whitehouse.gov website 
I'm going to contact them to see if maybe they would either, you know, either give a proclamation or give somebody from the White House to come. I'm in the process of trying to do that. I'm just trying to get the right contacts. Yes, I think it would be, it would be wonderful if they would, the better thing if they would come because more people can come to go to the White House. Mike, yeah. let me jump in for a second sure. to respond to the comment about the scouts. Uh, I did contact the people who came up with the merit badge and some of the current scout requirements. And the advice I got from the scouting organization is this is not a good time because they were being sued and thinking about bankruptcy. Um, but I do have those names. If other people have any contacts at the national level for scouting, uh, we have excellent contacts with the Girl Scouts because the SETI Institute and ASP have helped the Girl Scouts get all kinds of astronomy activities and, and programs. But if you have any good Boy Scout activities at the national level, Boy Scout contacts, uh, we'd love to hear about that. You can get in touch with me or anyone on the task force. I think, Andy. and maybe it's Girl Scouts. Kevin Marvel, Executive Director of the AAS, I know has worked with the scouting organizations himself. Okay, good. I believe, I believe he's done something with that, uh, with them as well. Um, and the, I know they have a STEM coordinator for the, you know, for the Girl Scouts, have a STEM coordinator. And I thought the pre I thought their uh, uh, Doug Duncan, thought the president hello. was a science person. The yep. Girl Scout president was a was an engineer, worked for NASA or JPL or something, if I remember correctly. And so, they, the so they're big, they're they're big into STEM. The Boy Scout astronomy merit badge can easily include solar eclipse and knocking off two of the requirements. So the, the possibility of using that with the Boy Scouts is already in the present day merit badges. It wouldn't be a problem at all. Okay. As I said, I looked and I was very impressed by the people who, who revised their programs. You know, again, they, so many of them would be very, again, I'd be very happy if all my college students learned everything that they require for their badges. Yep. In terms of both observation, skills, and knowledge. That's great. Uh, before I go to the next people, just make sure you're following. Uh, there are so many resources in the chat um, that we we couldn't we would spend the entire time reading those to you. So make sure you're looking at that. And I know the recordings will have that. Um, I the screen start jumping around, so I'm writing the names down so I get them right in order. And Jackie, I think you're next. Then I have David, Wayne, Doug, Spencer coming up. Thank you. Um, kind of going back to some of those resources for teachers. Um, one thing that we did here at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, while we weren't on totality in 2017, and we won't be again, um, unfortunately, but uh, doing a teacher PD on site, but also doing a webinar um, to reach those teachers that weren't able to attend the on site um, PD to not only just talk about safety, but also help inform the phenomena of the actual what a solar eclipse is really helped them and we put together actually a full packet of resources so we went through different lesson plans they can do with their uh, their students of how um the scale of the moon and the uh sun is very important in creating a solar eclipse also talking about scale of distance um and another thing that we did which um a lot of teachers found helpful was also also creating a mini webinar for the students themselves um, before and after and had them do an activity during the solar eclipse, um, looking at sunlight and or the amount of light that uh, was being uh, produced at, at the time, either before totality or during totality and after totality. Um, and then also um, looking at some of the animals around them, what, how are animals interacting? Um, and so having a structured activity for them to do during it really helped the teachers as well. But it was really fun to talk to students beforehand and also be able to tell them about that safety. And then they get to send in their information to us and we got to share what students got to um, actually saw. So that, having students feel like they are participating into something, it was really important as well. So that was a lot of fun for us. That is awesome. Thank you so much. 
Uh, David, you're next, then Wayne, you're after him. And then uh, so this Doug. Goes, okay, this goes back to student on student. Um, I had the privilege of working with a high school in Idaho um, and dis distributed materials to the sponsor of the astronomy club. Thank you, Claire. Um, and so perhaps NSO can, can play a role there uh, for the next eclipse. Um, but then with a key person in place, the sponsor of the astronomy club, he was able to recruit students from that high school club to go to the next door middle school and give talks to the middle school students about the eclipse from what they had learned from the materials. So the student on student was very important in that case. It was also very important to have a sponsor on campus to make it, to pull it all together and make sure that the students had the authority to go to the other campus and the blessing of the uh, administration over there um, to give these talks. But the student on student was really important. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Uh, Wayne. Again, following up on the student on student, it's too bad Rick Feinberg isn't in this group right now because I have a shout out for him. Many of you might remember that back in 2008 in celebration of the 400th anniversary of the telescope, uh, Rick and some others uh, developed the Galileo scope. And uh, so what we did is my astronomy students at Pensacola State College uh, had the option of building uh, Galileo scopes uh, for local schools or, or for themselves. And of course we got them at that time, the group purchase I think was like $25. Now they're, they're the, group, the group thing is still available but it's gone up considerably with the cost of shipping and optics and all. But still uh, the students would build the telescopes uh, they would dress them up in the uh, school colors. Uh, we would have a stargaze for the local schools. They would present the telescope with a safe water solar filter uh, to the science teacher at the stargaze. And we supplied more than 100 local elementary schools with this in a collaboration between the Astronomy Club uh, my wife's company, Drake Bow Productions, did most of the fundraising. Uh, we had local donors donating the telescope kits. Then we had the high school, well, we had the, uh, the college students building the telescopes uh, and then presenting them to the uh, elementary school teachers. And that was an excellent example of student on student. And then just before Mary passed, she came up with a project called STEM Spyglasses in which she used surplus 30 millimeter achromatic lenses and the erect prism uh, eyepieces from a little $8 Walmart uh, monoculars. And uh, we had the uh, elementary and middle school students at Earth Day, at the local science center and at several other activities build these very simple telescopes uh, for the students in Puerto Rico through uh, Ciencia, Puerto Rico and the Astronomers Without Borders. And so we provided over a hundred of these STEM telescopes and every one of the local students who built one of these telescopes filled out a gift card in which he told the students who were getting it in Puerto Rico that he built this at Earth Day on April the 14th, uh, 2019 for the students of Puerto Rico. So mm -hmm. we thought this was an excellent thing. And then lastly, after Mary passed away, we had a Boy Scout troop in West Virginia who picked up on the, pan, on the plans for the telescope that were published in Sky and Telescope. And uh, they built their own uh, STEM spy glasses and loved using them. And we supplied them of course with three solar filters for uh, solar observing. But this again is something that a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout might be involved in, uh, either getting a group order. I think it's, I think it runs about six telescopes for around two hundred dollars now. But you can check with Galileo 
with the Galileo scopes, but uh, they're not as inexpensive as they used to be, but they're still a wonderful uh, thing for elementary school classes and middle school classes to have. And we've got uh, two years basically to get a lot of these into the schools and have uh, these telescopes available for uh, solar observing with safe solar filters on that day. And, and for that matter, lunar observing at night, seeing Jupiter's moons and the craters on the moon and the faces of Venus and all that cool stuff that Galileo noted. So that was a very good student to student outreach, which we did uh, in the three years prior to 2017. And uh, we'll start doing again very shortly here in our local area. Awesome, thank you. I will say that this is not near as high tech as what he was saying. Uh, one of, and I get zero credit. One of our physics teachers uh, for a souvenir, and you're talking about like selfies. They, I'm sure there's a name for this. I'm blanking, but they took a little thin sheet of plywood and they drilled the holes in it, kind of like the seeing the eclipse through the trees. But they put their, it spelled out total eclipse 2017, and then Hickman High School. That was their school, and then they put that out there, and then they had all the little crescents as it led to totality on that. And that was just a cool almost zero dollar thing you could build too. Uh, I have Doug next, then Spencer, then Tom. So Doug, you're Let up. me quickly add something on the outline. Some of the really creative ones that were done in 2017. I um, remember people in both Tennessee and Kentucky drilled out the outline of the state yeah. on the plywood. And then you had the projection of the crescents with the yeah. state of Kentucky. That yes. was so creative. That's fantastic. That, that's, yeah, that's what I was trying to get at, and I didn't do a good job, but I love that. All right, Doug, you're up. Okay, well, I was just going to remark to everybody in the way of resources and planning, uh, our relatively small campus planetarium makes about $15,000 profit every time there's an eclipse, simply by letting the community know that we have safe eclipse watching glasses. Mm -hmm. And we have one particularly very good hardware store in Boulder, Colorado. It's been there a hundred years or something. And I posted in the chat a video that we made of the clerks at the hardware store because they had lines running out of the hardware store of community people all buying Eclipse glasses because they had bought them early. And uh, it's hilarious. I mean, they say it's like concert tickets. It's like sandbags when there's a flood. We've never had a product that we sold so many, and um, if now every time there's an eclipse, they do the same thing. So um, they are captured on video, posted in the chat, and, and I find them pretty persuasive if you're ever trying to get somebody and convince them that there's going to be a demand on Eclipse Day. That video works pretty well. I also wrote an article for the ASP magazine, Mercury, in summer 2015, and it's something like, you know, how to run an eclipse event for fun, education, and profit. Yep. And it talks about these logistics for planning such things. And, of course, I feel pretty good about that because we take the $15,000 and we put it back into our educational programs. And it's unrestricted money, right? It didn't come from the school budget, so we can do whatever we want yep. with it. Doug, thank you for that. I can't agree with you more. It's, uh, I, I would rather student groups and schools make money on this that, you know, in that your ideas are great. Spencer, you are up. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Um, I haven't heard anybody mention it yet, but there's this thing called the herding cats problem. I'm sure many of you have experienced this and it happens when you have a group of about 400 people, about half of them school age, and they seem to lose their minds. Um, crowd control is something that may that we may want to think about. Um, I'm gonna post a video of the 2017 and, and you can see in this video, if you go to the five minute mark, how excited people are. And one thing that gets me about this video is 
I had all my, my cameras and stuff set up. I had my telescope set up. It was gonna be automatic. And so I was enjoying the clips, but what I did not realize was there was a bunch of kids running around having a good time. One of them passed one of the legs of my tripod and bumped it. So all my shots, the sun is down here and my camera frame is right oh. here. Um, the crowd control is a very serious issue and I wish people would would uh, pay more attention to that. I think it's a good point. I will say one benefit we didn't have, and I I, I don't know if it's because of this, by keeping our schools open that day, and then the parents were allowed to come with them if they wanted. I, I felt we did have a huge park open up, and then community could go there, but the parents were going with their kids at the schools and so instead of like two areas in our town that had viewing we have now 35 and I don't know I don't know if that I have I guess it had to help but I don't know if, uh Theo or Angela or Dennis do you have any suggestions on that so being in the stadium where where people were were in a sense constrained and they could be excited and jump up and down but they weren't running around mm -hmm. um that was kind of a, a good natural constraint um you know, we actually had activities during the partial phases where we got different groups down on the field and let them run around just to, you know, burn off some of that because you can't keep school kids sitting down for hours and hours and hours. But uh, yeah, there's there are ways to, to kind of creatively address that. And yeah, um, I, I mean, I'm a natural photographer and that's what I would have been completely doing that day, but you, you can't run a public event and hope to do that simultaneously. I did have a camera set up that managed to, on its own, catch the diamond ring with the stadium in a very wide view. Otherwise, I was just had a camera that I'd never used before in my <laughs> hand. And at the appropriate time, I, you know, snapped a few pictures. But, but yeah, it's having the adults with the kids. And, and we did, I think, have some parents, because since they were essentially on a field trip to see us, they had, you know, some number of chaperones. And so there was enough control that it, that it wasn't a huge problem. I think uh, the teachers I talked with, what was critical was to have activities. And first of all, not necessarily go out right at the beginning of partial, but to go out part way through because the partial lasts for a long time. Uh, but to have, you know, there was foods and they had a picnic. So there was food lined up for the food. Uh, the one that had music and, you know, they, they, they set up a time to do some dancing, get people up and our students up and moving around. So I think it is planning that time with activities versus thinking you're just going to go out and stand around for 45 minutes or an hour or whatever it is to just wait until totality. Uh, if you're in the path of totality, um, you, you need to, you do need to plan the time. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Tom, you are up next. Thanks. Yeah, I encourage everyone to uh, go to Stellarium and take a picture of what the sky from their location is going to look at that on that night, because you're going to be able to tell people to the top left of it, you're going to see Jupiter and to the bottom right, you're going to see Mars and you're going to be able to explain that to people before they see the doing. So during totality, they can literally see the lineup from my location, Niagara Falls. I just checked and literally five, five of the planets are literally within a few degrees of, uh, of the eclipse. It's going to be a fantastic experience to see that, especially if we can prepare people. And this is the order of the planets you're going to see. And, oh, there's Sirius and this other star or this uh, constellation in the bottom left. As I was doing that, just to mention to everybody, uh, as it turns out from this location, nine minutes before the partial eclipse starts, the International Space Station is literally flying right past the moon and the sun at that exact time. Um, and uh, we don't know if that's going to be the case because those uh, ISS uh, routes are iffy this far in advance. But I think it'd be a good idea for people a few days before the event, check the ISS transit because we might get another show at the same time. <laughs> but that, a, might bring, that might bring some other uh, things because if, if you're gonna try and see a ISS transit 
in front of the moon nine minutes before the partial, you could be hurting your eyes because the sun is right beside it. So mm -hmm. it, it introduces a bunch of other issues. So I just wanted everyone to be aware of that. Tom, that's great information. Thank, Thank you. you. So those are the hands I see up and that those are so many good things. Uh, Theo, Angela, Dennis, I, I've not been able, anything you've seen on chat that you wanna point out <laughs> because I have not been able, I've just seen a ton come up. Well, most, of any other see, most of the things I see on the chat are comments of okay. advice, resources and so on. If I, if, we, if I missed one, whoever put up a question should raise their hand and then bring mm -hmm. it up verbally, but I think we've covered almost everything that's in there. Yep. I wanted to I put in a plug for, uh, we didn't do glasses. Let's see if I can put this up and not have myself disappear. Yep. There we go. We see it. We did the, the rectangular viewers and we asked um, Rainbow Symphony in this case, they punched a small hole in there and we hung every one of them on lanyards. And this is because, again, with kids, especially of a certain age, if you give them glasses and three hours are going to pass, where are those glasses going to go? You know, they're not going to have them on their face the whole time. They'll be under them on the seat. They'll be sat on, stepped on, whatever. This way, we hung them around their necks. And when they needed them, they were where it needed to be. And it was easy to say, OK, everybody get your viewers. We're going to check to see what the sun's doing. And uh, we actually had the... Uh, I made one of these that was about three foot big for our mascot <laughs> and the uh, Western Kentucky mascot is called Big Red and that's actually a really good description of what it is. So he had a giant one and he was able to show the kids how to use these, but I just thought that worked so well, better than the traditional glasses glasses for that kind of an event. And in fact, they said it was, they Rainbow Symphony liked it so much, I think they're going to incorporate that this time around, but it, it just works. And there's the hole is small enough. Once you clip the lanyard in, there is zero chance that you're going to try to look through the hole. Um, okay. <laughs> so that worked well Good too. Good point. Uh, we also got all of ours from Rainbow Symphony. Uh, that's where they, they were really good to work with. Yep. Uh, well, I have to plug American Paper Optics. Our club bought from those folks because they're in Tennessee. The club is okay. in, I'm in Tennessee. So we had to do that, but, but they're also very good to work with. And, uh, and yeah, just order now, gosh. And as oh, many yeah. as your pocketbook can stand and you will not, I promise you, we had people, like they said, running out the doors, banging on the doors of the planetarium. Please, do you have more glasses? And when the whole Amazon fake thing hit, we had so many calls. And so, yeah, it was just, you. you there has not yet been an eclipse for which too many glasses were made. Nope. Right? That hasn't happened and I'm not expecting it to happen. I know it's hard for school districts. Like I had to convince our finance people, I need, I need $10,000 to buy glasses that I'm going to sit in a box for a, almost two years, but it worked and we made it back. Uh, Dan. Uh, I know I kind of brought this up in the larger group earlier, but, um, and uh, Andy's comment just made it uh, ties in perfectly, but thinking about that pre-K uh, age group, especially reaching out to uh, nursery schools. I mostly say that as I am in literally my nine week year old daughter's nursery and she'll be two years, two months old on the day of the cliffs. Uh, something I may have calculated uh, the second she was born, but uh, I'm thinking about, you know, what's that experience for her? What would preschools do? Um, thinking about how nervous kids might get at that age. Um, I know this ties a little into the informal learning, but there's some great Sesame Street resources out there for which they've covered the eclipse that way. And I know that has some overlap into informal, but uh, connecting those in, uh, I think of the PBS resources into some of that early age schools, I think is definitely something to look into. I know personally in Rochester, I'm trying to get Sesame Street to come out to us since we're one of the closest cities and why not? Uh, for which if you're doing anything lunar eclipse related in the ne uh, next month, they do have a great clip from the mid 80s, early 90s of Oscar the Grouch cheering the moon disappearing. But um, just kind of thinking about those resources for that younger age. Mm -hmm. Storytelling is a fantastic resource. Uh, as Andy just mentioned. So just thinking towards that younger age because they're still schools. Yep, that's right. That's right. 
any anybody else or panelists any anything that's come to your mind while everybody shared i think it's amazing that you know we didn't have to do any poking or prodding there was just this huge amount of great information and fun stories so i think that's wonderful we have such a good base to start from yeah we were all ready to to throw some questions in and we just haven't touched actually you've got actually the question fake questions we had were all addressed already but uh we didn't need them there was one question that came up it wasn't a question it was a, a statement that came up in the chat but it may warrant a bit of discussion if you have a few minutes before we wrap up um, and that was the discussion around multilingual resources and I feel like that's more pertinent than ever with this, uh, the 2024 eclipse, because it's passing through three countries with three primary languages. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts on, um, on best practices or uh, distribution of multilingual resources. It's a great question. I, maybe it's that I saw something post up there where some, some link had a whole bunch, but yeah, we, I don't, but we, we should. Any panelists have anything on that or anybody? I was gonna say, um, because I also work with Astronomers Without Borders, um, we have national coordinators who are all amateur or professional astronomers. And as with any translation, you wanna make sure that you have someone who knows the correct technical language um, and ideally is a native speaker. So, um, we've been able to tap into that resource. For, but then of course, with Spanish, there's a lot of regional differences as well. So, um, you know, we're gonna have to, I'm sure in San Antonio, <laughs> you can find uh, resources to help make sure you get the right flavor of Spanish there. Um, yeah. I believe but, I heard the NASA people say at a task force meeting that the materials they're producing will also be in Spanish, but okay. if someone from NASA is here, please correct me. Great, thank you. Uh, George, you have your hand up. Uh, do you hear me all right? Yes, we do. Yes, uh, we do. Uh, I'm a retired uh, chemistry astronomy teacher, but I'm a volunteer in a museum here in Paris, Texas. And one thing that, that uh, we've had fun with is uh, going to a website where you can put in your longitude and latitude and find out when the last eclipse was in at your location. And in our case, it was in the it was the 21st of of uh, July in uh, uh, 1618. So for uh, multidisciplinary things. Uh, We've uh, been looking back at what it may have been like here in Paris at that time and, and how uh, uh, the Native Americans or the Caddo Indians uh, may have reacted to uh, the sun going out. Uh, we've also uh, gotten apps for, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, cell phones and uh, tablets and uh, gotten... Uh, apps for astronomy and uh, put in, of course, our longitude and latitude and then run the date back to then. And it shows the moon uh, uh, covering the sun uh, in 1618. And those are some fun things that we've had for education. Those are great, thank you. Uh, Joseph. All right, and I'm just gonna um, circle back to the conversation. And uh, when we're talking about multilingual um, development, developing multilingual um, things for uh, audience, it's also helpful mm -hmm. to develop, uh, uh, in addition to like the three dominant languages in North America, like English, French, and Spanish, uh, depending on if you're doing like a locally sourced event, it would also help to like look at uh, regional um, community languages that are very popular. So uh, from where our organization is based in the Toronto area, we do tailor primarily in the English language, though we do also attempt to do multilingual reach out. Uh, we're gonna look into expanding into French, of course. And then um, also for the various um, community, minority community languages that are very popular in the Toronto areas. Uh, in the past, we've done uh, Hindi and Arabic uh, themed content for people. And uh, I think uh, going forward with like Eclipse content, reaching out to those communities is a really um, 
uh, is would be a really exciting opportunity if we're talking about like generating multilingual content. Mm -hmm. Good ideas. Yeah, that's one thing I did not, I don't think we personally did well last time. So we need to do a better job this time for my district. Wayne, did we, Wayne, did we get you? I can't remember. I don't remember if that's new or not. Yeah, this is new along okay. with the Astra. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, you're good. Okay, along with the Ast uh, Astronomers Without Borders, uh, we were discussing um, a few minutes ago about uh, Spanish language dialects. Uh, the uh, uh, Gretchen Diaz, the head of uh, Ciencia Puerto Rico, uh, we did a translation of the directions and usage of the uh, uh, STEM spyglasses uh, that my wife had designed for the elementary schools in Puerto Rico. And then as a follow-up, Gretchen asked, uh, would we be able to find uh, an astronomy club member uh, who spoke Spanish and a videographer where we could actually show them the steps and how the telescopes were built and used and uh, we didn't have a Puerto Rican, uh, but uh, uh, one of our members was from Cuba. And uh, I think the dialect would be close enough that Gretchen said they didn't have any problem in Puerto Rico. And one of my uh, former graduate students from the University of West Florida is now a public relations officer in the Navy. But before she left for OCS, she did the video for us. So they now have uh, for the students in Puerto Rico, how the telescopes are built and the images of how to use them for safe solar observing to determine the sun's rotation, uh, to see lunar craters, to plot the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus and stuff like that. So this is something that in our pluralistic society, uh, probably in your astronomy club or certainly in your college, uh, just reach out to uh, the foreign language department or uh, members of the astronomy club. And it's a great way to uh, uh, get interdisciplinary uh, linguistics and art and uh, uh, science together and the whole essence of STEM. Yep, I agree. <laughs> Well, guys, we, this was a fantastic discussion. I would like to end by offering an opportunity, because then there's a break and some other things, for either Dennis, Andrew, Angela, or Theo to any closing thoughts or, or things to look forward to. I'll definitely share. Um, it was a lot. It was great to hear all the different um, things that y'all did do in 2017. So now I kind of feel the pressure and having to plan and prepare a little bit better for the upcoming um, eclipse. So thanks for sharing all of the ideas. They were very helpful. And I look forward to having our campus and our district participating at a larger scale. Yeah, Angela, I wish I had, I, I was right with the last one. I wish we had something like this when we did that one because it would have been so much better. This has been fantastic. Anybody else? Well, and I think we are ready for 23, 24, because a lot of people saw in 2017. Yep. The resources are there, the excitement is there. So I think we're in good shape. I too wanna to thank everybody. There's some great uh, comments and suggestions and we have your emails. So you may find that we will be coming back to ask specific questions about resources. Uh, I really do wanna get anybody who has letters to administrators, this will be, uh, uh, Great to have. I put that right in at the beginning of the chat. So uh, you may hear from me again, but thank you to everybody for all the input, comments, and getting ready for 2023. Let's go get them. Yep. Dennis or Andrew, one quick question that just popped up, and I think I'm right. When, when this is recorded, do, is the chat also recorded? Yes, I'm saving the chat. Okay, perfect. So to whoever just posted that, you will have access to the chat uh, when that goes out. And just to, to say that uh, after this is over, the next thing we're going to do is to go to gather. So you need to go back to the instruction letter you received from the AAS task force. And I also just posted it in the chat, Andy. So oh, the, the links okay. are 
mm, quite recent in the in the chat. If that's good, so useful. the next step is to go to gather, uh, where there will be networking and a poster session, and then to remind you that at four p.m. Pacific and seven p.m. Eastern, we'll have the uh, public lecture uh, by Angela, and uh, then we'll continue tomorrow as. Uh, was mentioned in the chat, one of the things we were able to do in the 2017 eclipse was to make libraries community centers for information and glasses, and over 7,000 uh, libraries uh, participated in this, and we're hoping to increase that number uh, this year with increased funding. So you'll be hearing a little bit more about that in the library session tomorrow. So that, that's what's coming up. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. And before we go, Andy, I just noticed she's a participant. She posted directions on how you can save the chat right now yourself if you'd like. Uh, but Claire also did too. So you'll get that later too. So thank you, everybody. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions.